Well, a very, very, very good morning to everyone today. Morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Well, church, I got to tell you, it is wonderful to be back in Iowa. It's great to see the sunshine and everything, some decent weather. Had rain and storms all week long last week down in Georgia, and it's really, really, really nice to be back. <laughs> um, as we go through our announcements to this morning, we are starting week five of the Truth Project, and we're going to talk about science and what is true. And through this segment in here, Dr. Tackett uh, talks about scientific investigation, the systematic study of structure and behavior in the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. So it's also a valid way, a very good valid way of asserting and ascertaining exactly what is truth. When we open the box, we find it's filled with voices that speak to us loudly about the majesty and the power of the one who created the physical universe. So it's got a lot of great things um, going on with this study. And, and it's hard to believe that we're almost halfway through the 12 week course. So awesome, awesome course. Orange track racing, June 11th, already coming up here in a couple of weeks. And we're also going to have family fun time out here in the square that day. And so I want to make sure that everybody's up for that and ready to go. And then following up with that on July 2nd, 6 p.m., same back station, same back channel right here, we are going to be doing the Faith of Our Fathers movie. And uh, that should be an awesome, awesome uh, movie. I think it, it will really kind of tie into everything uh, very well for the 4th of July and, and kind of bring a good basis of how we follow through with the faith of our fathers and the example, the living example that they had for us. Um, so what I'd like to do now is we have a short video that uh, we're going to go through, and then I'd like to open us up with a prayer. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Freedom with the dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high, but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. The sloping hills of Arlington National Cemetery with its row upon row of simple white markers, bearing crosses or stars of David. They add up to only a tiny fraction of the price that has been paid for our freedom. Today we pray that those who lie here have found peace with their creator. And we resolve that their sacrifice will always be remembered by a grateful nation. Fall and give silent witness to the price of our liberty, and our nation honors them this day and every day. So, as we prepare ourselves in our hearts and our minds for celebrating this Memorial Day, it is a cause for us to stop and think about those who have given and paid the ultimate price for us, for our freedoms. And as we uh, look at that, I, I want you to remember that all gave some, but some gave all. So let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, on this Memorial Day, we pray for those who courageously laid down their lives for the cause of freedom. May the example of their sacrifice inspire in us the selfless love of your Son, 
our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless the families of our fallen troops. Fill their homes and their lives with your strength and your peace. Embolden us to answer back the call to work for peace and justice, and thus set, seek an end to violence and conflict around the globe. Lord, as we come into your presence today, we ask for that frame of heart and frame of mind to understand sacrifice, sacrifice of your son Jesus, to break us out and give us freedom from our sins and from a death sentence in that sin. Lord, he paid the ultimate price. Is these troops we are celebrating tomorrow and through this Memorial Day weekend have given it all and paid the price. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you have given us an example that we might live by in your son, Jesus. As we come into our time of worship today, I pray that you would bless Pastor Terry as he uh, prepares to give his message that you have laid upon his heart to speak to us today about theology, about the study of you and what you are in our world and who you are in our world. Gracious Lord, we pray to you and thank you for the opportunity to gather here freely and openly today to worship you, to celebrate you, and to glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our call to worship this morning that Pastor Terry has picked for us comes from the Colossians 2, verses 2 and 3 from the New International Version. And it says, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So have you ever thought about Jesus as, as a secret? And here Paul tells us that Jesus is God's secret, but he's an open secret for saving the entire world. So what does that mean? Well, God entrusted Jesus to be our guide to God himself. For those who believe and follow Jesus, he will guard our, height, our hearts and our minds to be like the mind of God. All of God's treasures are hidden in Jesus. That's what it says here in, in the scripture. And see, if all of God's treasures are hidden in Jesus, God's secret is expanded then to include us. Since we are in union with Christ as believers who have faith and trust in him. And for us, it's common for us to think about treasures being just simply gold and silver and things and material things of the world. But the idea here is that Paul's talking about is that it's a reference to the wisdom and knowledge that's needed for us in Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus is where we look for those abundant treasures to supply our wants and needs in order to be in union with God. See, that plays into exactly what we've been talking about in theology, in truth, in anthropology. Who is man? Who is God? What is truth? Because we find those truths in Jesus. God has supplied all those things that we need to lead us to him through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mark. As I think about Memorial Day tomorrow, I, I just catapulted back like, okay, more decades than I want to admit.
to when I was just about yay high. And mom and dad and would get my brother and I in tow and we would hop in the car and we'd go to a little town of Boxholm. And for those of you who don't know where Boxholm is, it's over by Boone. <laughs> just a little tiny town. We'd go out to the cemetery there. And the thing that I always remembered was the 21 gun salute. These seven guys, three shots each. And for me and my brother, it was neat. We'd go pick up the, the, the casing. And I have one or two of those in a box at home. I know I probably don't need them, but it reminds me of that. And, and that is what my memory is, but I also remember that it also rained a lot on Memorial Day. And as a small kid, your mind works differently than as an adult. And as I thought about it, I always thought it was God crying over the men and women who had died for our freedom, just as he cried when his son was crucified. Now, one, one thing that I, we forgot to throw in the announcements is that, and this, this is simply a flag, it, it, it symbolizes our country, but this come in about two weeks, Pastor Mark and I will be out at Kirkwood and we will be participating in the flag retirement ceremony there. It starts at six o'clock on Tuesday the 14th. And at that time, it's, it's another difficult time because we sit and we read names of all those who have passed in, in our county and the number of people, the number of names, men and women that are off, were on that list just last year was immense. You never think, you just don't think about it. And it, it is ultimately because we do have a faithful God, a God who loves us, that we have an example to live by. And today, as we talk about theology, and I'm, that's another one of those $10 words that everybody looks at you kind of funny and wants to walk away from. Them. So we're just going to, we're going to change that. And we're just going to say, who is God? That's, that's what we're going to talk about today. Who is God? Over the past three weeks, we started off, Pastor Mark kicked us off the first week with veritology, another one of those $10 words, but we simplified it and said, what is truth? And unfortunately, in this day and age, truth has become relative. It's whatever someone wants it to be. The following week, uh, we had a message about philosophy and ethics. And how important it is to have those. And then last week, uh, we had another $10 word, anthropology. Not to be, and as Mark said last week, not to be confused with archaeology anthropology and study of man. Who is man? But as we get into this week, who is God? In order to fully complete the message from last week, we have to understand who God is because in Genesis it says what? God created sin, his image. Now, we've explored the concept of truth and we've examined the biblical view of human nature. Today, uh, we tackle what uh, Dr. Tackett calls the third and most important part of the foundation of our truth temple, and that is theology, the study of the existence, nature, and attributes of God. We not only need Him, we need to know Him. And today we're going to tackle the question, real short, who is God? Now, we don't have enough time to completely cover this. This is something with that it's a lifelong study. So this is just like a, a short summary of that. Well, hopefully not too long, but a shorter summary of that. Like cliff notes for those of us that are old enough to remember those bright yellow books. I forget what they call them now, and I think they're even red. They've changed the color of them. But it's a question that we grapple with. Who is God? It's a question that even Christians 
sometimes we'll grapple with because the Satan, the evil one, he puts those seeds of doubt in our minds. Now, I loved how Dr. Tackett started the lesson this past Wednesday when he said that comprehending and defining infinity might be easier than answering the question, who is God? Now, as a kid, we were told that space is infinite. It goes on forever. And I used to lay on the ground out in the country where we lived on the grass in the middle of the summer, and I would watch the clouds go by. And then as it started getting darker and the, the stars came out, I would gaze into the stars and understanding that those were thousands and millions of light years away. And then my head would spin. Because understanding that there was never an end. We're, we're human. Everything has an end. We have birth. We have death. You, know, you, you light a candle. It starts here and it ends and it goes out. There's a beginning and an end to pretty much everything we know, but not when it comes to God. God exists outside of time. God exists outside of what we understand, so it makes it difficult to understand who He is. And knowing God helps us understand what the meaning of life is. This means that when we have an intimate and personal relationship with him, we have a better understanding of that. And it is only through this relationship that we can have eternal life with him. Dr. Tackett says, knowing God ought to be our passion and highest goal. For until we look upon his face, we cannot rightly know ourselves or begin to grasp the meaning of our existence in the world. It's not something that we can do on our own. And to understand who God is, is it's much more daunting, more demanding, and, and more overwhelming than anything that we can possibly think of. And I, I was, as I was preparing the message, I was just thinking about all the different words that, that make up God. And, and I like word clouds. I don't know about you all, but I like word clouds. And so I made a word cloud, and it covers off all of these different things. And there's no duplicates up here, and this is just, a, again, a summary of some of the things. I mean, we have sovereign, merciful, unchanging, self-sufficient, good, mighty, truthful, caring, impartial, holy, powerful, righteous, omnipotent, glorious, omniscient, omnipresent. Immutable, compassionate, patient, wise, gracious, faithful, good, loving, just, and infinite. And I thought it was appropriate because that's what I was talking about just a short time ago, oh, just a moment ago about infinite, infinity, to put that front and center. But it, when we heard the... the call to worship this morning from, from Pastor Mark, it's, this passage is almost like the ultimate source of truth. It kind of uh, does that. So the passage that he read was from the New International Version. I'm going to read from the message because this says it just a little bit different way. It says, I want you woven into the tapestry of love. He wants us together with him. And it continues, it says, in touch with everything there is to know of God. Then you will have minds confident and at rest, focused on Christ, God's great mystery. All the richest treasures of wisdom and knowledge are embedded in that mystery and nowhere else. I just, that first part where it says that it's woven in. It, it, it's the Bible. Jesus is woven from beginning to end. God's love is woven from beginning to end. And as Christians, we are woven into that love. And we can become a part of that. And so it tells us that God is that ultimate source of truth. As Christians today, we are seen as small or narrow-minded, so small-minded or narrow-minded, because we believe in God and we believe in an ultimate truth. 
and increasingly in our society we are looked upon as being narrow-minded. We're told that we're being held captive by an antiquated book of fairy tales. Well, I'm here to say that this could not be further from the truth. As followers of Jesus, we have seen firsthand what he said to those who believe in him. And that, I go to John 8, 31 through 32. It says, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It was true then. It is true now. And it is true forevermore. Part of the problem is that truth does not hold the same meaning today that it once did. Today, like I mentioned a moment ago, truth seems to be relative. For many, their reality dictates their truth. And without this truth, there is nothing to guide us. There is no meaning or purpose to life. Is it any wonder why 25% of our country is depressed and another 25% is on the precipice of that. It would just take one instance to push them over the edge. That's nearly half of our country being at or near a full depressive state where they have no hope. Now, to me, that's pretty <laughs> Kind of playing on that, it's pretty depressing, and ultimately, it's down, it's more of a, a, a downright frightening thing to me to think that so many people are that close to the edge. Someone that, uh, about a former neighbor of ours, and it turns out that he was a, uh, a police officer who had worked with Diane's brother, succumbed to. His mental health issues recently. We see that all too often in obituaries. They, and it's worded in such a way that it doesn't say it, but you can read through the lines and know that their life didn't end naturally. Now, until recently, and I should probably define what recently is, uh, especially so. Considering humans, we've been around for thousands of years, right? So I'm talking just about the last couple hundred. People, a couple hundred, two, three hundred years ago, they expected, it was an expectation that God would reveal himself to them. In 1646, the Westminster Assembly attempted to draw up a reformed confession of faith around this, in which they tried to capture the very essence of God's nature. Now, if any of you have gone through it, uh, some kind of a catechism or you know whatever that was called in your church at, when you were younger, you may have read through or seen a portion of the Westminster confession or catechism, which is several chapters long. But this is more of a synopsis of this, and this comes straight from chapter 2, uh, and it's, I believe it's the very first bullet point. It says, there is but one only living and true God, who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body parts or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, Almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will, for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, the rewarder of truth that diligently seek him, and withal most just, terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. 
That was uh, quite a bit. And he, understand that that is a little bit difficult to understand because it was written in the mid 1600s. It's not written in the, today's English. But they are just barely, it's, they're just scratching the surface of who God is. They were trying to put it down, trying to write it down. Now, some of you may have tried to explain something to someone in the past, how to get somewhere or what something looks like. My job every day is helping people guide them through their, uh, their cellular devices. I can't see what they have in front of them. And I, I tell them, you are my eyes. You have to tell me what you're seeing. And then I have to try and guide them through that. Here they are trying to guide us through as to who they saw God as. And I have to imagine there was some frustration there as they tried to, to get it all down because it's, it's impossible. But it is in knowing who God is that we can have eternal life. John 3, 16 from the New Century Version puts it this way. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him may not be lost. That's why I like this, this uh, translation. May not be lost but have eternal life. Some say die. But I, when I think lost, because lost indicates the fact that it's not just after death. It's right here, right now. It is in knowing who God is that we can have eternal life. And if you're lost, you can't. But that begs the question, what is eternal life? Now, this is a very important question that needs to be answered. It's also important to understand that there are two different versions of eternal life. The first is a gift from God. It's the one that, as Christians, we know. In Luke 18, the rich man asks Jesus what he has to do to inherit that eternal life. And Jesus tells him that he must follow the commandments. And the man tells Jesus that he has. Then Jesus invites him to follow him, but he says this. He says, you have to go out and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. In verse 27, Jesus answers the question about who can be saved. In the rich man's mind, selling all his possessions and giving that money to the poor seems impossible. I mean, how many of you have a hard time getting rid of stuff in your own house? Stuff that you haven't looked at in time, five, ten years. I see the smile on my wife's face. She knows what I'm talking about. We know the boxes. We know where they're buried in the back of the family room that is now a storage shed. It's hard. But Jesus ends this in verse 27 saying, what is impossible for people is possible with God. Jesus is telling this rich man to trust him by giving away everything or selling everything and giving that money to the poor. Now, there's several verses here, uh, John 4, 13 through 14, and John 5, tw uh, 24, John 5, 39 and 40, John 6, 27, John 6, 54. It's all these verses up here, right? Jesus tells us over and over again in these verses that we have to turn to him and believe God's word to have eternal life. And, and this, this last one, John 13, 17, I'm just going to read verse 3 from that. It says, and this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the one, only true God and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. See, this version of eternal life means that we spend eternity where? With God. Now, a lot 
lot of churches, that, that's where it would stop. We're just going to talk about eternity, we're going to talk about eternity with God, right? But there's also another version of eternal life that gets left out. This version of eternal life could also be called eternal death. This is the faith that people who reject God, reject God's word, and reject Jesus will suffer. And I say suffer because it's not, there's no end, it's eternal death. Daniel 12, 1 and 2 says this, At that time Michael the archangel, who stands guard over your nation, will arise. Then there will be a time of anguish greater than any since nations first came into existence. But at that time, every one of your people whose name is written in the book will be rescued. And a lot of people will stop there. Yay! Let's have a party. Everybody's rescued. But let's go to verse 2. Many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life. Here's, the, here's this other part. Some to shame and everlasting life disgrace. Now a lot of you uh, you might know the passage from Matthew 25. Jesus is talking about final judgment and he's talking about the angels returning and separating the people as a shepherd would she separate the sheep and the goats. And if you remember that passage, those who were doing things not even knowing that they, you know, they were just doing things. They were doing things because of the love that Jesus has for us. They were doing things for others. They didn't even think about it. It was just part of who they were. It was woven into the fabric of their lives. And then there were those that said, when did we ever see you naked or hungry or in prison? And as he separates those that didn't see or didn't do those things, he separated as the goats are separated to one side and the, other, the sheep to the other. And this is how he ends his teaching in this passage. This comes from Matthew 25, 46. Jesus says, and they will go away, where? Into eternal punishment. But the righteous will go into eternal life. See, it's not enough to get your attention in this passage, if it's not enough, if it doesn't grab your attention, because this is kind of a, it's not, I wouldn't say a watered down, but, well, let's just see how John writes this in Revelation 20, 15. He says, and anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So we go from eternal punishment and John, John brings it out a little bit further and says they will be thrown into a lake of fire. I don't know about you all, but that does not sound like a good place. And I can't speak for anyone but me, but I want to know Jesus. I know Jesus, but I want to know him more. I, it's a relationship, and as relationships go, they don't just stagnate and stop at some point and you're good. They continue to grow. And I and so when I say I want to know Jesus, I want to know him more. Philippians 3, 8 and 11 says this, Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Now, put this in bold. This is the first, first part of verse 10 says, I want to know Christ. He continues, he says, and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. 
What I what did I take out of that? I took out of that that knowing Jesus also means loving one another. And this is what God wants from us. Hosea 6.6, 6, I want you to show love, not sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. The Old Testament, yes, there were sac sacrifices were set up to atone for sin, but God would much rather we show love and know him than to offer those sacrifices. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, this is what the Lord says, don't let the wise boast in their wisdom or the powerful boast in their power or the rich boast in their riches, but those who wish to boast should boast in this alone. Hear this part, that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth and that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. See, God already knows you. He knows the hairs on your head. But he wants you and me to know him. We must understand the connection between the knowledge of God and the knowledge of self. So that came to a different kind of question for me. What is your name? An interesting question to ask at this point. What is your name? We cannot know, truly know ourselves until we have started to know who God is. Now we've talked about some of the characteristics of God already, and that was in this word cloud, right? Well, one of uh, those that's not on the screen and I intentionally left it off because I knew I was going to talk about it later. But we hear that God is what? A jealous God. So let's look at some of the other names of God. I got another word cloud because I was just having fun. And the one I put right in the middle, Elkanah. We're going to get into what that means here in a moment. These are just a few of the names of God. I see one up there that I, I, I know Lori loves, and so should I, because I know she loves to sing that song. Mm -hmm. But Yahweh, Lord, God, Jehovah Shama, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha. Adonai, Jehovah Jireh, and then I'm transported to that song that I Elevation Worship in Maverick City. So these are some of the names of God, but this is the one we're going to focus on right here. And I have a reason for that because in our study on Wednesday night, Dr. Tackett talked about something that caused him to stumble in his faith for a moment. It was about Two different kings, and when they served, or when they, uh, when they were uh, the kings of Israel and Judah. Let's start with Deuteronomy four twenty three and twenty four, where it says, "So be careful not to break the covenant the Lord your God has made with you. Do not make idols of any shape or form, for the Lord your God has forbidden this. The Lord your God is a devouring fire. He is a jealous God." Now that, and the, the, the part that I wanted to talk about this is, is that God being jealous has caused me to stumble a little bit because what does the scriptures tell us? That we should not covet, we should not be jealous of something somebody else has. It is in this very thing that God is jealous that has caused actually a famous talk show host to stumble and ultimately turn to uh, other fake forms of faith. This person, as well as countless others, have asked questions about how can God be a jealous God? How can he be jealous of me? He's God. And, and why can God be jealous, but I can't? Their confusion is because they don't dig deeper into the meaning of the word. And, and I, 
I can't say this enough, and I know Mark can't say this enough. Read around the passage, dig in, and understand. Get and look at how Strong breaks down those words and turns them into the original text and what that means. Because in this instance, contemporary definitions of jealousy or the word jealous include hostile toward a rival or one believed to enjoy an advantage. Another one is feeling of resentment because of another's success advantage, etc. Or unhappy or angry because someone has something that you want. These definitions are sinful. And we are told in the Ten Commandments, specifically Exodus 20, 17, that we should not covet or want anything that someone else has. In fact, there are at least four warnings in the Proverbs that tell us we should not envy, which is just a synonym for jealousy. Now, since God is righteous and, the, and holy, this definition cannot be what is being described from this passage in Deuteronomy. So let's go a little bit deeper. The Hebrew word that is being used for jealous is kanaf. El kanaf. Which is usually translated as impassioned. Totally different meaning. Think fiery passion such as the passion that is associated with love. Now, we had a tragedy this past week when, what was it, 22 people died because of a mass shooting. Here's the fiery passion in that. Two days after one of the teachers died, her husband, because of his passion, his love for his wife, and his grief, he had a heart attack and died. He loved his wife. Zechariah 8.2 says, This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says, My love for Mount Zion is passionate and strong. I am consumed with passion for Jerusalem. So Elkanah is about the marriage relationship between Yahweh and us. His jealousy is not out of selfishness, but out of a passionate love for us. The Lord tells us twice in Deuteronomy 31, and it's repeated in Hebrews 13, that he will never fail us nor abandon us. That's how much God loves us. So you see, names mean something. In the study Wednesday night, Dr. Tackett talked about how some of the names mean things. Jacob, which means supplanter, was changed by God to Israel, which means strives with God. Abram, which stands for father of height, was changed to Abraham, father of multitude. Moses, the meaning of his name is taken out of water. He was. Simon meant hearing. Jesus changed it to Peter, meaning rock. Saul, which meant demanded or means demanded, was changed to Paul, which means little. When you read Paul's writings, he talks about how you can get that sense of how he feels he is just small or little in the grand scheme of things. And then in the New Testament, we, we hear, you shall name the child John. Speaking of John the Baptist, and that means God is gracious. And then also, you shall name him Jesus, which means Savior. So all this said, I thought, I'm going to look up and see what Terry stands for, because it's not Terrence, it's, it, it is, it, that's my mom and dad picked Terry. And the first, there's two or three different ones. And one is powerful ruler of people. And I have been a leader in, in, in past positions. Another one is power of the tribe. 
But this is the one that I think resonates with me the most, and it simply says this, one who aids or assists. Now as a pastor, we lead the church, but as a pastor, we aid and assist people on their walk with Jesus. How telling that God had my parents name me here. Our names are what people call us, but our identity, here this is more important, our identity is found in Christ and as a child of God. Regardless of what your name is, if you're a Christian, your identity is in Christ and as a child of God. And because we are children of God, we often find ourselves under attack. So let's talk about that battle. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says, We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture the rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. We use God's mighty weapons. So this morning in my, in my time with God, in my reading this morning, I'm reading out of Samuel and David and his men are hiding in the back of a cave. And what happens? Saul's out looking for him, but Saul has to go to the bathroom. So Saul goes into the cave. David's men say, kill him. Here's your opportunity. Kill him. David's like, mm, no, he's, he's God's anointed. So he cuts off a piece of his robe. Saul leaves. David hops out and says, addresses him. He says, if I had wanted to kill you, I could have. But it's not David's place to use his worldly weapons to take Saul out. God will handle that later. Throughout history, people have constantly tried to destroy God's word. And it, it's not just been God's word, it's also been his very nature and character that are under attack. And people have twisted it, they have distorted it, they have denied it, and they have ignored God altogether. And the attempts have tried to extinguish, suppress, discredit, destroy, dilute, deny, and ignore God's Word. The results? Yeah, God's Word, that Bible, most printed book in history. Still, every year, it's the most printed book. And in a world where everything's going electronic, it's still the most printed book. Voltaire, who back in 1776, so we're going to go back a little bit. He said, a hundred years from my day, there will not be a Bible in the earth except one that looked that is looked upon by antiquarian curiosity seeker. In other words, it'd just be uh, a curiosity for people as opposed to a guide. He also said it took 12 men to start Christianity, one will destroy it, and that one, he's thinking he's going to be able to destroy Christianity. That was 1776, this is 2022. Um, I don't think we'd be here, not in this place, if he had destroyed Christianity. Robert Ingersoll, who was nicknamed the Great Agnostic, he said in 15 years I will have this book indicating the Bible in the morgue. That's a pretty specific time frame. Guess what? 15 years later, he was the one in the morgue. Not the Bible. Just to add insult to injury, a pastor purchased his desk and spent the rest of his life writing sermons on it. God has a sense of humor. Throughout history, men have tried to destroy God's Word. But here's the thing, and I'm going to echo Peter in, in uh, 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25, he echoes what Isaiah said in 46 and 8. As the scriptures say, people are like grass, their beauty is like the flower in the field. And what? The grass withers and the flowers fade, 
but the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that has been preached to you. And we look at that in context of what Voltaire and Ingersoll tried to do. God's just got a sense of humor. He's like, yeah, no, that's not happening. Because why? Because God's word can be trusted. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. God's word can be trusted, but it is alive. It is powerful. It tells us how to live our lives. It tells us how to treat other people. And I don't know about you all, but in my day-to-day -day -day interactions with others, I can see how my trust in God's word affects others and how they respond to me. I treat them with the love that Jesus has for us, that God has for us. So who is God? God is who he says he is in the scriptures, not who people who want to go out and cherry pick the scriptures say he is. Because I manage the, our website and I do all, I take care of a lot of our social media, I spend a lot of time on social media. And I see the character assassination of the scriptures and of God and of Jesus all the time. But here's what's encouraging. The people of God are standing up to it more and more. And giving rebuttal answers to questions and statements and they're giving it not with their perceived reality but with fact we've we we did the uh, the Bible overview where we went through the entire scriptures and to understand how it was put together People are using that kind of understanding of the scriptures and of God to tell others who God is. What are you doing? To not only find out who God is for yourself, but who God is as it pertains to the entire world. Get in the word if you're not. Spend time with God each and every day. Make time for him. If that means waking up 10 minutes early to read a little bit, then do it. 10 minutes. Go to bed 10 minutes early. Get up 10 minutes. Or go to bed early. Get up early. Spend more time with him right away in the morning. Because there's something about spending time with God first before you do anything else that will help you to understand who God is. Now I am looking forward to the next lesson because it breaks up into two. First part of that, as Mark talked about before, is we're, we're going to be going into science and in this first part on Wednesday, we're going to be going through a systematic study of the natural world where we will see innumerable evidence of intelligent design. We will see how science matches up with the scriptures and it will do nothing. If it does nothing other than this, it will help you to know who God. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to spend time with you today. We thank you for a teaching on who you are and how much you love us. The fact that you are Elkanah, or what we would say is jealous God, is you are in passion. You love us that much. You love us just as a husband should love his wife. And a 
wife, she thought it was her, her husband. Guide us through this week, Father. Help us to take the teachings that we receive each week and weave them into our daily lives and make it a part of who we are. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Terry. Theology has always been something when people hear that, they kind of go, dude, and they kind of shrink back a little bit. But really, as we see here, theology, theo is Greek for God, and ology means to study. So as we go through this, anthro is about man, and ology, anthropology is the study of man. So we're studying God. How do we do that? We have Wednesday night studies here. We have our opportunity to gather together as believers in the Word and to study and to grow and to know so that we can go out into the world and pass that knowledge on to others. So I think it's a, a blessed opportunity for us to be able to study God's Word, to be theologians ourselves. How about that? You're all theologians as of today. We all study God in one way or another. We have to take a look at history. We have, we have to remember what has gone before us because history is cyclical. It happens again and again. So today, as we are in our Memorial Day weekend and here, it's a call to remember those who have fallen, remember those who have given it all, and to remember in this time of communion this morning to be in remembrance of Christ and the sacrifice that he made. He gave it all for us to set us free, to give us those freedoms from sin and from death so that we can have eternal life to spend eternity with God. Won't that be great? We all get to be there. Cool, huh? Well, hopefully. <laughs> you won't mind hanging around with us a little more. So as we come into this time of communion today, some of the things that I, I think are very important is that the things of this world are temporal. We are temporal, our bodies. And as, as uh, Terry pointed out in, in 1 Peter, people are like grass and their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers, the flowers fades. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that is preached to us. So even though we are temporal, we can live on through that word of God, through that relationship that we have in Christ. So I'd like to have you remember that as we go into our communion time this morning. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he took bread and he told the disciples, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. Later on in the meal, he took a cup, he lifted it up. He says, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Scriptures tell us that each time that we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we do it in remembrance of Jesus, of his sacrifice. We remember his setting us free, the freedom that he gave to us through this act of salvation. The body of Christ broken for you. blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. As we come up into our time of prayers for the people, it's a time that we can celebrate the things that God is doing and has done in our lives. And so I want you to remember some of those things in here. I want you to remember back to relatives who have passed away, who have gone and and served in the military, 
to give us our freedoms that we have today. I would like to celebrate those who are actively there today and lift them up in prayer today as well. I'd like to lift up travel mercies for those who are traveling this weekend. Um, I was telling uh, Pastor Terry and, and those this morning that I witnessed as we were coming through four different accidents, four people lost their lives just in traveling for this weekend. And so we have to be mindful that, you know, we face dangers and we never know when our time is gonna come. And that might be not through any fault of our own, but through the acts of another, as we had with, with the shootings in Texas, the horrible shootings that are taking place. And it goes back to that talk about the evil that's in the world. And that evil in the world is waiting for us. And we have to be prepared. And we prepare ourselves with our hearts in Christ. Does anybody else have prayers they would like to lift up today? Okay. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty and most gracious God, we... Thank you for the opportunity to gather here together in your name today to remember sacrifices made by those who have served in, in uh, freedoms and in getting freedoms for us. We remember the sacrifice of Christ, the sacrifice that he made to give us our freedom through love, through honor glory. Lord, we ask a blessing on those who are traveling, who are not able to be with us here today, that we would put a hedge of protection around them to bring them back home safely. Lord, we lift up those who have lost their lives due to tragic accidents, due to senseless violence, due to evil in the world today. Lord, we lift them up. We lift their families up as they try and reconcile themselves into what has happened and why. The problem is there really is no reason why. But it's simply evil enforcing itself upon our lives. Lord, we thank you for being bigger and greater and bolder than any of these things. Lord, you are more powerful than any evil that exists in the world today. We call upon your grace. We call upon your mercy upon this world. We call upon your favor for your people. Those who believe in you, those who follow you, Lord, bless us with your favor. Keep us focused on you in our lives so that we may know you, that we might go to be with you in your gracious, precious, and holy name we pray today. Amen. As we prepare to end this portion of our service, our online portion, I'm reminded of Paul's words of encouragement from Philippians chapter 4. He says this, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me everything you heard from me and saw from me doing then the God of peace will be with you. And not only will he be with you, the God who knows you, you will know him. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name.